Okay, it is 103, so we are going to get started. Um, thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. We are extremely excited about today's speaker, Sonia Huber. Uh, it's definitely going to be a wonderful, um, very interesting workshop. Um, and then following the workshop, we'll have just a couple little updates from US Pain Department staff. Uh, and my name is Emily Lamiska. I am Director of Communications. Um, and I'll be sort of emceeing the event today. So I'll go through some housekeeping items at first, then we'll um, be hearing from Sonia and her wonderful workshop. We will have some time for questions at the end of Sonia's presentation. Um, so you'll be able to ask those. And then, like I said before, we will have just a few quick updates from the different departments at US Payne. So we hope you can stick around for that. Just some housekeeping items. Um, hopefully a lot of you are already familiar with our webinar format, but you can enter a question at any time by typing it in in the control panel at the right. Um, even if you're typing it in during the presentation, um, we might not get to it till the end of the presentation, but you can feel free to write in questions as they come to mind. Um, and we will do our best to answer all of those. If we don't get to all of them, um, you're always welcome to email us and um, we will get back to you. I also wanted to make sure everyone is aware that there is a, a handout that Sonia created for us, um, and that is available to download on the control panel at right. It's called Sonia Huber Handout, and that has some information. Um, and just a note that that will, you know, once we close down the webinar, that will disappear. So if you want to download it, please do so now. Um, also, as with all of our webinars, um, this is being recording recorded so that way you can watch it at a later date if you want to if you enjoy it hopefully you can maybe share it with a friend um, or if you have to jump off early just know that you can refer back to it and those are all posted on our website at uspainfoundation.org backslash webinars and so this event um, it is one of our bi-monthly webinars but it's also part of our november campaign which is our very clever little title for November, um, and an educational campaign that we do every year. And this year, the theme is art through pain. And of course, you know, art isn't limited to just visual art. It can be writing, it can be so many different things. Um, but that was sort of the catalyst for having Sonia um, speak with us today. And so this is actually the last event in the series for the month. Um, but that said, we do still have the opportunity for you to submit your artwork to be included in a slideshow in our next newsletter. So we welcome you to do that. Just visit the website um, up on your screen here and do that by this Friday um, for inclusion in the December newsletter. Um, we're also going to be thinking about ways we can use artwork that's submitted maybe in a future Invisible project. Um, or in a blog, but we will definitely be in touch with you about that. So I encourage you to check that out. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sonia. Um, so Sonia is the author of five books, including the award-winning essay collection on chronic pain, Pain Women Takes Your Keys and other essays from a nervous system. Her other books include Open Nobody and Cover Me, a health insurance memoir. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Brevity, Creative Nonfiction, and other outlets. She teaches at Fairfield University, which is here in Connecticut, and in the Fairfield Low Residency MFA program. You can find her online at www.soniahuber.com and on Twitter at, at Sonia Huber. Um, on Twitter. And all that information is on the little handout we have for you guys. Um, so with that, I'd like um, to see if we can get Sonia's webcam up here and I will turn it over to her. There she awesome. is. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sonia, for being here. I know, you know, as a director of communications and a writer, I'm so excited to hear from you. And I know, you know, I've heard a lot of people are excited as well. So we really appreciate your time. Um, and with that, I'll let you take it away. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and so thank you to Emily and to US Pain Foundation uh, for existing and for inviting me to do this. Um, 
yeah, I'm just very excited to be with everybody who is interested in these two topics because they're both really uh, close to my heart. Um, uh, so I thought I would start out by telling you a little bit about me. Um, I uh, was diagnosed with first with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and then really quickly after that um, with uh, rheumatoid arthritis in 2009, 2010. So, um, so yeah, it's coming up on my 10 year anniversary uh, of having pain. Um, and uh, I thought I would go back uh, to sort of the beginning of that experience to kind of describe a little bit about uh, what led me into writing about pain. Um, uh, at first, uh, after I got diagnosed, I just, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, lying in bed. Uh, at the time I was uh, uh, working full time as a teacher. I had a, a five-year-old and, uh, you know, I was freaking out <laughs> like many of us do uh, if we have uh, adult onset diseases and are suddenly struck with pain. And, um, you know, at, at first, uh, what I really felt was, a, was really wordless and that was really scary for me. I think as a writer or as a human being, it's terrifying to suddenly have a new experience and have it be so overwhelming that I couldn't find words for it. Um, and so what started me writing about it was first just, you know, making notes on my phone to just try and survive to keep myself sane. Um, and to just kind of not panic, uh, I was listening to a lot of, uh, Buddhist podcasts and, uh, you know, one of the things that really comes up a lot in, um, Buddhism is the idea of impermanence and constant change. And in some of the meditations I was listening to, um, there was a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, body awareness and body scanning. And so it started me to think about uh, the idea that rather than being crushed by like this anvil of pain, I was actually having a lot of different pain sensations in my body that changed over time. And, uh, and that was sort of a real wonderful revelation to me. Um, I think for people that don't have pain, uh, they often think of it as like, just like a big X, like it just cancels out your life and your, your daily experience. Um, and, uh, and I started uh, much later when I, when I was uh, writing the book, Pain Woman, I was wrestling a lot with the work of um, Elaine Scarry, who's a theorist who wrote a really important book called The Body and Pain, The Making and Unmaking of the World. And she had said in an interview, she basically says, she's talking about pain in the context of torture, mostly, but she talks about pain as being a wordless experience. And that really um, terrified me because, uh, putting words to things is how, uh, how I get through them. Um, so she talks about pain as being something that saps language from us. And, you know, while I uh, haven't gone in through any kind of extreme excruciating pain that very well might sap me of words, the kind of chronic pain I live in, I think there really is a possibility of putting words to that. And not only is it possible, but I found it, you know, just completely uh, essential for my survival to do so. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so what I started doing, laying there and doing these body scan um, uh, meditations was that I also started indulging in one of my favorite vices, which is metaphor. So uh, everybody who is in my, uh, my writing group knows that I have a metaphor problem and that uh, I have a special metaphor problem when it comes to Star Wars. So every single thing I write in the first draft, like Princess Leia and Chewbacca appear, like there are solar systems, there are asteroids. So yeah, I just, I've, I've got a serious metaphor problem. I love them so much. Um, so I started really indulging in that because I had a lot of space in my head to do so. Um, so I started kind of going wild in my head 
uh, with trying to find metaphors that would explain the, the pain in my joints and the fatigue in my body. Um, uh, so I thought I would read um, just of the very beginning. Here's my book. It's got a nice uh, colorful co cover, and that was actually really important to me too. And using University of Nebraska Press, which is my publisher, they're really wonderful. And you know what I asked them was that I wanted something that had a bunch of different pieces because I wanted the image to of pain having pieces and parts and it not being a big unifying canceling, canceling thing. So here's one of the first um, weird extended metaphors that I wrote. And this is from the first essay that I ever published about having pain. Um, and it's called The Lava Lamp of Pain. Pain moved into my body five years ago. It wasn't the whack of an anvil or the burn of a scraped knee. This pain sat warmly on the surface of my hands up to the elbows, like evil pink evening gloves, with a sort of swimming cap clenched on my head, with blue plastic flowers at the base of the neck and a nauseating blur in the eyes. At other times, the pain was a cold ache at the knuckles with a frazzle in the stomach and a steady and oblong ache from hip to hip across the pelvis. It was a rigid curled ache in the toes, like the talons of a predatory bird. Um, so I, I break a lot of rules in uh, writing those metaphors in that, number one, they are very mixed. So in, in a lot of writing workshops, you hear that uh, the advice not to mix your metaphors. And so I've got a predatory bird right there with evening gloves and you know just a bunch of other things. It's like this word salad of metaphor. Um, and, and that really appealed to me for um, a bunch of different reasons. First of all, um, even though I was in pain, I still wanted to have fun with language. And I just feel like you know, that even though I've written a collection of essays about chronic pain, even though the topic was serious, I let myself get, uh, go completely off the rails when it came to like playing with language itself as a way to kind of balance the experience. Um, so, um, and another thing that you probably notice in there is that a lot of them, the, the language sort of veers off into nonsense a little bit. Um, so I sent this first uh, essay in um, to the rumpus and you know what happened to me after that was I was very unsure about it because it's really weird and and then after that finally got published I heard back from a lot of pain people that I was describing something in a weird way that they had also experienced um, and uh, yeah, I think pain is kind of a weird trip in a lot of ways. And so the encouragement from other pain people is what really motivated me to try and keep playing with language. And um, and I really think that uh, it feels like a collaborative book project because I don't think I, I would not have continued writing the essays if it hadn't been for the experience, the, um, the uh, encouragement of other pain people. So um, one of the things that I think is so important about uh, using metaphor is that using metaphor really helped me to, um, to change my relationship to pain in my own head and in my life. I felt uh, at the beginning, I really did feel very overwhelmed. I felt like as soon, like wherever I looked, pain was, right? And wherever in my body pain was, and pain was had affected every corner of my life. And then the more I tried to be very exact about the metaphors, the more I found that, uh, that pain wasn't actually everywhere. And the image of the lava lamp meant, is, has meant a lot to me because it, the shifting nature of it means that it changes. And if something can change, 
that means that it's not all pervasive and all crushing. And that's been something that I've I, I've really needed both as a writer, but also spiritually as a person to know, even though I feel really bad in this present moment, wherever I am, for example, the next moment, it's going to feel slightly different. Um, so, you know, and I think I'm so interested uh, at the way, too, I wanted to share a little, little bit of research um, about the fact that it's not just me that is really interested in the intersection of um, language and pain. So uh, as I was uh, researching for the different essays and kind of collecting them over a couple of years, I came across um, the work of a really important researcher, Dr. Ron Melzack. Um, and uh, he, he started uh, researching pain. It's, his, it's been his entire career. Um, and uh, his name is listed on the handout if you wanted to Google him and look him up. He also has a lot of great videos. Um, so uh, what he did was he started working with uh, people who had phantom uh, limb pain and he listened to them and he asked them to describe their pain and uh, it always gets me choked up just thinking about it because so often we're asked to rate our pain, you know, on a one to 10 scale or for me in ways that just don't capture the experience. And so the fact that he took words from pain people and then he used those words and he, you know, he grouped them in sets and he analyzed them and he made this beautiful thing that's a clinical instrument called the McGill Pain Scale. Um, and it's named McGill because he was working, he works at a, a pain research institute at McGill University in Canada. So uh, there's a link in the handout. There's a short form um, McGill questionnaire and a long form McGill questionnaire. This beautiful thing, it feels to me like a poem generator. You go through and you pick it out. It, it sort of elicits a very specific response to the kind of pain that you're having at a certain moment in time. Um, researchers use it. It's been shown actually to be cross-culturally um, uh, uh, consistent. So it produces real data for doctors at the same time that I think at least for me as a pain person, here was this instrument that uses language that really made me feel seen and it made me feel sane. So, so I write and I have this like fantasy in the book about um, going on a road trip to bring Dr. Melzack, you know, some cookies. And I never did that because that would be kind of stalkery, but I wanted to. Okay. So then the next exciting thing that I found really recently about metaphor is that uh, I was recently on a uh, medical humanities chat on Twitter with a bunch of doctors. And um, one of the things that um, one of the clinicians, I was talking about metaphor and I was tweeting about pain woman in my experience. And then a doctor uh, shared a study with me and this link is also in the handout. Um, it was from 2013 in the Clinical Journal of Pain. It was a controlled trial and they gave uh, some of the patients a booklet of metaphors and stories that uh, convey the pain experience, basically to help people uh, give language to what they were going through. And um, they gave uh, another group just a list of, you know, things to de-stress, suggestions for de-stressing. And the amazing thing that they found was that the group that was supplied with metaphors and language had real measurable significant gains in um, their well-being. You know, their pain was not decreased, but their ability to cope with it was better which I feel like is um, kind of mind blowing and really exciting and um, points to the way that there's so much important research to be done about the, the, the need we have to put, um, put words and metaphors to our experience. So 
Um, I thought what I would do is, uh, given this, is that I, I might um, have us uh, do a, a little writing exercise. And um, you can, you know, feel free to do this or just jot some notes or to do it later. Um, but one of the things that I was thinking about as I was, um, uh, as I was, as I was wondering, you know, how to, how to describe a possible um, method for coming up with metaphors is um, I really wanted also to come up with language that expressed the idea that um, that pain isn't necessarily my enemy. Um, I know people have a lot of different sort of feelings about this say with uh, the treatment of cancer in particular, right? We always hear that um, the person has been in a brave battle with cancer. And I, I agree that there are many times that I really feel like I'm fighting pain or that pain has just beaten me. But there are other times where I don't want my life to be a constant war. Um, so, you know, I have a, a poem, extended poem at the beginning of the book where I kind of, like I describe pain as sort of like a cross between an egret and a space alien. I don't, it's, it's a weird thing. You can check it out uh, if, if you'd like. But, um, but so one of the things that I want to invite you to do as we go through these exercises to, is uh, to think about um, odd but non-threatening metaphors for pain. Um, and for me, that always starts with trying to observe the specific physical sensations that you might have going on. Um, uh, you know, so you can think about uh, toys, kitchen implements, furniture, uh, food, you know, anything that seems like not what you would associate with pain. Um, in its most nefarious uh, incarnations. So uh, this idea of trying to understand uh, kind of like a multi-step process in writing pain was actually taken from um, a wonderful writer, Michael Knoll. And he, uh, he did kind of an analysis of some of uh, my own, my writing pain um, on his blog, Read to Write Stories. So Michael Knoll has a great writing textbook that you can check out. And I've um, included a link to his work and his blog also on the handout. Um, OK, so he describes what I do as um, building complex metaphors. So uh, the first thing that we're going to do is um, just start with the basics and I'll write for a few minutes, I'll do it too. Um, and I'm just gonna give us three minutes for each of these things. So the first thing that we're gonna do for three minutes is I'd like you to just focus on the describing very concretely a kind of pain in a specific part of your body. And um, some of the language that um, Melzack uses that I find helpful, sometimes pain seems to me to be very near the surface of my skin, and sometimes it feels very deep in my bones. Um, I've heard of many pain people describing a pain in temperature. So is it hot or is it cool? Is it, um, is it, is it tingling or is it stabbing, right? Is it... Uh, and then you might even go beyond those sensations to talk about like, you know, is it nauseating? Is it annoying? Is it, is it you know, weirdly sludge-like? I don't know, anyway. Um, so we're gonna focus on just a specific part of your body. If you're not in pain at all, bless your heart, and you can focus maybe on muscle tension. Okay, so one specific part of your body, and we will write for uh, three minutes. Just describe.
Okay, you take half a minute or so and finish up that, that idea. Okay, so the second thing is that we're gonna take that, uh, whatever sensation you wrote, and we're gonna start to get a metaphor -y. So you can look at objects around the room, think of objects in your life, think about if the pain was a substance, if it was a food, if it was a person, um, if it was a mode of transportation, it was, if it was clothing. And one of the things that um, Michael Knoll points out that I, that I like is that uh, he says, don't swing for the fences right away. Take a few practice cuts at easy pitches. So uh, he says that it's, it's helpful to start with something tentative if you don't know that you're gonna wanna commit. He says you can start with the phrase, it was sort of like. So think about the pain as an object. You can start with, it was sort of like, and we'll just write for a couple of minutes on that. Okay, and then um, uh, the, there's a last piece to this. Uh, so I'll just share that uh, when I was planning this, but then also today, like for some reason, I keep thinking about the image of uh, those, there's a name for them, I know, like the, the, the segmented gloves that knights would wear you know, like they're jointed and they're like this sheath over your hands. I keep thinking of my hands are bugging me always, but right now. And so I just keep thinking about those clanky things, right? And how if, how hard it would be to, uh, to move your hands. And so in my mind, I've got these gloves on, right? And now here's where uh, I would like you specifically to have some fun with this. So we're gonna move into ridiculous ridiculousness. Um, and so uh, I would take the night glove metaphor and I'm going to write a little bit about what it would be like to go through life with those days. I might try and think about what it would be like to try and butter a piece, to piece, of, piece of toast for my son wearing those darn gloves. So, you know, you can take this in any, any direction you want, but get really serious about your metaphor and just take it like a step further than you think uh, is okay. <laughs> All right, so we'll try that for two minutes. We had a couple of people write in and say that the, they think the word is gauntlet. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> One of the are so smart. Mind. That's awesome. <laughs> My gauntlets. <laughs>
All right. So, um, uh, so I ended up having fun with that image because I thought about, you know, just how how great it would be in a mate meeting to like slam one of those gloves down on the table or how you could always hear me coming, how I might like to paint little fingernails on my gauntlets, how I would magnetize things and I might have kitchen magnets stuck to them. Um, uh, you know, it, I'd sort of like follow a metaphor into ridiculousness, but then often I find that even when we, um, when you let yourself free associate, then I would, I often end up uh, finding the space to come back into something, right? Like, so towards the end of writing, I was thinking about, you know, the battle itself. And I was also thinking about how with an invisible illness, how much I do want people to see it and how I do sort of wish I had these noisy things I could rattle so people would know what was going on with me. Um, uh, and then the last thing that Michael Knoll writes about is that, which I noticed I was doing, is that, um, you know, making lists of I was doing this, I would do this, or it would look like this and like this and like this. That sort of a um, a listing uh, is a kind of brainstorming that allows for a lot of fun images to come out. Um, and so, yeah, I hope that that was nice and enjoyable for you. And I just wanted to um, end by saying that, um, you know, I wrote a whole book. It was really driven by metaphors about chronic pain, but I really feel like uh, I'm not done with the metaphors because I, for, my, for myself, I feel as though metaphors help me function and they help me understand what I'm going through on a day-to-day -day basis. When I talk with other people about um, the metaphors and the pain I'm feeling, it makes all of us feel less alone. And I have seen, you know, so much brilliant writing in the past couple of years come out by people who are writing about chronic pain. And, um, and I feel like we're all working together to build a language to both explain our experience to each other and to more fully explain it to others. And so I think that's important work. And so um, I hope that, uh, that we will all continue doing that. And um, while writing about the pain itself, the, the experience of pain isn't a joyful one. I really do find joy in getting to know the pain through metaphor and in um, sharing it with other people. Um, so thanks for letting me talk and um, I'm looking forward to your questions and thanks so much for joining us. Awesome. Um, thank you, Sonia. That was really interesting. I was, I myself was trying to um, follow the prompts. So um, what I'm interested in is, I don't know if anyone typed theirs on their computer and might be interested in like maybe sharing like a line or two. Yeah. Um, some examples. And I know, you know, as we're sort of talking about it, it can be really personal. So um, if you're not comfortable doing that, that's fine. But if anyone has like a sentence or two they came up with that they were kind of felt was, was a good one, please send that along. That'd be awesome. Um, all right, here we have one is, uh, let's see. It was sort of like an army of fire ants marching across my skin. <laughs> as I'm That's as perfect. I'm trying to write my metaphor, I'm desperately wishing I had a can of raid. <laughs> yeah. So I'll bring you a little humor in there too. Oh, that that's helpful. good. <laughs> More coming in here. So we have water, sand, and silicone mixed in to form a tight bond of my fortress. Oh God, I uh, love. Yeah, that's a really lovely one. Well, not lovely to be feeling that, um, but. Right, right. Sort of just lovely because the image is so specific that it's like, yeah, I felt that too. Right. Oh, this one's really great. Um, and I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this correctly, but I'm going to give it my best shot. The pain from the osteonecrosis that I have in my skeletal system often feels like a hawk is scavenging for food within my various joint capsules. Holy, yeah. It's 
continues on, but um, this hawk is never satisfied. He scavenged. He scavenges all through the day and night. Once the hawk emerged in 2006, he has never left. Wow. That's really great. Yeah, that's breathtaking. And actually, that's really interesting because the next one is also um, similar <laughs> birds of prey situation going on. Wow. Um, vultures sits on my shoulders, gracefully ugly claws clenching to my bones. I'm heavy, so heavy. So we have a, a ton coming in, and they're all really amazing. Um, and so what, and something Sonia and I had talked about, and um, what we'd like to do is, and especially seeing how awesome these are, and how different, and I feel like I could just, we could spend the next like 20 minutes just reading yeah. through all of them. Um, but what we'd like to do is, take some of these and feature them on our blog. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I forgot to make a slide with this information, but what we can have people do is if, if folks are interested in sharing and having their metaphor featured on our blog, um, if they could email it to me, and that's emily at uspfoundation.org, and then I can share it with Sonia, um, mm -hmm. and we will, you know, kind of, pick a handful to share um, and be able to highlight them that That'll way. Yeah, That'll let me read a, read a couple more since we have, they're so good. I feel like, and we've got like, like tw at least 20 people have submitted them, which is amazing. Okay. Um, let's see, this one is about CRPS pain. Today's pain is eating away at my hand the way a ravenous black bear gnaws on the frozen carcass of an early winter moose. Whoa. <laughs> pretty amazing wow i feel like a lot of people are feeling the animal metaphors today yeah um, um the pain is a freshly boiled kettle being poured into the teacup of my ankles oh my god that's that's like so that's very striking right yeah and like you think very commonplace kind of yeah. this is always awesome. And that would make me think too of like, you know, if you're gonna take it a step further, like what does that tea taste like? Or who is drinking that tea? You know? yeah. Like mint tea. Yeah. Um, ooh, this one's cool. Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna like I'm gonna have to cut myself off because I would just read all of these. Um, like chewing on a piece of cotton wool or eating one of those Safeway sugar cookies with pink frosting that crumble instantly and make your teeth hurt. Oh my God. Talking about like you know, kind of like a trigeminal neuralgia pain. That's what that would make me think of. That's fantastic. I mean, the pain's terrible. The metaphor is amazing. I know it's, it's, it's hard to, <laughs> um, and this one's also, okay, I'm gonna do one more because otherwise I'll just, we'll just I'll stay here all night because these are all incredible. Um, but this one, like someone's doing home renovations in my skull, except they accidentally took out a support beam and are pressing against the walls to keep the ceiling from caving in. Oh my gosh. I mean, you can feel that, right? Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Wow. No, these are really wonderful. So again, um, because these are all so great and I feel, and they're also, you know, everyone wrote just like a few sentences. It's just right. really nice, very like digestible and just really powerful. Um, so I feel like we could probably share a bunch of these on our blog. So again, you know, please send them over to emily at uspfoundation.org. Um, I will share them with Sonia and we will, you know, put together a little compilation and then share them um, on our blog and and on social media and that sort of thing. So then we also, um, you know, I, I'd love to just read you these awesome metaphors all day, but people <laughs> had some specific questions. So I wanted to get to those. Yeah. Um, so one question someone had asked was that they, many creative writers that they know who communicate metaphors have anesthesia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and I think that's where you like feel or see or oh. experience things in like colors or, or sound. I think, oh, yes, I'm, yes, I'm, yes, yeah. but so they were wondering if that's something that you sort of have or, um, or if you would just 
say it's just your creative you know spirit i have a uh i think a lot of people creative people have some version of this I have a weird, like, I happen to have a weird, like, spatial thing, whereas almost everything I'm doing ends up connecting to locations for me. I don't know why that is or if that's even related to that. But um, I do think I've got, like, an especially, uh, like, low association filter. So, like, and I think that's something that's, like, like, a sport or a skill that you can work over time to, like, let your brain associate in weirder directions. So I just feel like I've really built that up over time. But I think, um, yeah, and I think too, like there's something about, you know, some creative writing instruction that tells us to restrain our metaphor and not be too wild. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, to, to, to sort of teach yourself over time that it's okay to break that rule and really go wild. Like if it makes you happy, you should just do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that sort of ties into this other question um, we had, which was someone saying uh, or, or asking, um, they're curious if you see yourself more as an adult or as a child when you're writing about pain. Oh, I love that. I love that question because I've been thinking, I, you know, I teach undergraduates and, and a lot of them are at the age like between childhood and adulthood. And a lot of them are like, are sort of, you know, wrestling with like, oh, being an adult seems so stressful. And so I just told them the other day in class, you know, you can, you get to keep part of your kid if you want to, you just have to learn how to function as an adult. But I, I really feel like for me, my particular brand of writing works well if I key into the kind of views and opinions and associations I've had since I was a little kid. And so I, yeah, I, I guess, I guess there really is that I have that strong element of, of, of wanting to stay connected to that. And so, yeah, that's such a great um, question or insight. I really do think I go in little kid directions a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, you kind of have to have that like childlike kind of curiosity. Yeah, and uh, sense of play, you know? Right. Um, let's see what else do we have here. Um, someone was asking, do you think that metaphor is especially suited for the sort of quote unquote wordless topics like pain and grief, or do you use them heavily in writing about any topic? I think that's a great question. I mean, I think I know I overuse them no matter what. Um, I, I almost think as though uh, if, if there's something like an abstract or complex experience, I'll go to a metaphor first to try and then feel my way into explaining it to myself and then other kinds of writing will follow. But I feel like especially for really internal experiences where there isn't a lot of external expression, um, I think those are the kind of things that are so helpful for th that metaphor can really help us break down that barrier. Um, but yeah, I think I think with almost any personal experience, a surprising metaphor can sort of allow someone to come in and, and experience it with you. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got time for a few more questions and there's a lot of great questions. So if we don't get yours, um, just as a reminder, you can tweet at Sonia, um, you can email us, you can find her on her website, but we'll see if we can get to a few more. Oh, yeah, here. And I, put my, I put my email address on the handout, so okay. if anybody wants to contact me, that's great, too. Oh, perfect. Okay, so yeah, so send your metaphors to Sonia or I, and we will um, combine them somehow. Um, so someone else asked, and I think this is a really great question, um, especially for, you know, for US Pain Foundation's community, a, a lot of our community is extremely disabled. Um, and so she was asking, what if you have trouble expressing your pain in a, like a non-threatening metaphor or, you know, when the pain really is that consuming um, and debilitating, like how do you, do you have any tips for trying to like find the space um, the mental space to be able to put it into words. 
Yeah, I mean, I've also, I've often had the experience, I was just having a conversation on Twitter with its folks about this, that actually when I'm in a lot of pain, it's much easier for me to text or write even than talk. Like for some reason, you know, verbal expression is really hard for me. Um, I often, if I'm feeling like I just can't do metaphor or things are really bad, um, I focus just on color. Like a lot of times I'll just close my eyes and I will just think of, a, 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 you know, I think of like a storm or I think of, you know, the Northern Lights, like sort of just this flow. And then also kind of like um, uh, the lava lamp image, like when I'm having, when I feel like I'm really getting taken under by stuff, like I just go to those basic images of like images of flowing and, you know, light and dark and color and um, even having an image like that in my head lets me watch something and then I feel like I'm less, I, I'm being taken under by it less. And so then sometimes, I mean, really, sometimes what I do is I'm just writing sim simple words, like single words or phrases on my, the notepad in my phone um, or texting to myself. And um, I do it mostly because uh, it's comforting to me. And also when I'm in those intense experiences, you know, where you really feel like you're just breathing through it from one second to the next. Um, I'm almost using those words as like stepping stones, like let me just get through this to the next thing, right? And um, that's the part that really does feel sort of like an altered state, you know? But um, I, don't, I don't do that out of a sense of like, I've got to write about this or I'm making an essay. I just do it as a way to get through it. And then often when I go back, um, it ends up being that I do want to use it for something because it, it tends to resonate. But yeah, so I, you know, I, I use this often the idea of images, you know, both to write things for other people, but also just for, you know, for coping. Mm. And it's really, I think it's really interesting because I don't know if anyone had tuned into our webinar earlier in the month, but we did a webinar on art therapy. Mm. Um, become you know, certified in art therapy. It's a very, you know, it has increasing like clinical credibility. And it's interesting mm -hmm. that there's not something similar um, for writing necessarily. Um, yeah. You know, it, I feel like it is such a good, it, it can be so therapeutic. And from what, you know, the comments we're getting from people, it seems like a lot of people feel similarly. Um, so just a couple more questions. Um, and something that kind of relates to the last question was sort of how do you take care of yourself when writing about pain? Um, mm -hmm. Because it, it can be kind of, you know, um, emotional or, or difficult to do. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I'm always writing about more than one thing at a time. So I wrote the pain essays while I was writing other stuff that had nothing to do with pain. And I like the ability to to go back and forth. And actually I wrote, everything in Pain Woman was just written while I was having particularly bad pain days. So when I was feeling better, I would be for the most part um, writing other things. Um, and I think, you know, you know, writing about the pain has ended up being a way to um, also for, of self-care partially because number one i'm I, I tend to like to make jokes and so a lot of times if there are funny experiences or like really awkward experiences that involve pain like there's a whole essay in the book about um you know like chronic pain and sex and how uh i wrote an essay about that topic and how awkward it is for oprah magazine and then I wrote a little tiny thing. And then I wrote a bigger essay about what it was like to tell my husband that I was writing about our sex life for Oprah and how I was like, what have I done? And he's the cool one. He's like, this is great. It's going to be fine. And I'm freaking out. And uh, so, yeah, so, you know, I mean, I think that there's always funny stuff, you know, for me. And so I really try and like 
save that stuff or I save the moments where I'm like, there's some awkwardness or there's just, you know, so that then you, I kind of have a scrapbook of like, you know, these are moments where pain has not only taken something from me, but also not, I, I guess you could say in a way, given me something or brought me to the point where I, I would not have been here without pain. Um, and I, t I write a lot about like my connection to other people with pain because that has been so important to me. Like everybody who is on this webinar and everybody who contacts me, you know, and who I read. So I end up, you know, I, I write about um, also all the ways that I've learned to take care of myself. Like I am by nature pretty type A, but I've had to be like a type B on the couch person, you know? So yeah, I, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. I think so. Um, so a couple more questions for you and then we'll let you go and move on to our updates. But um, someone was asking about what do you do when you are having, or do you have any sort of personal tips for experiencing like writer's block or feeling sort of stuck in writing about pain or, you know, how do you, how do you get out of that? Sort of I, um, that's a great question. I mean, my, my, my general philosophy about writing is that I set a time period that feels okay and doable for the day, you know, whether it's an hour or whether it's 15 minutes. And I, um, you know, I sometimes I'll even write the time period on like a piece of paper. And then I know I have, uh, I'm gonna try and focus for those 15 minutes or, or an hour, half an hour. But I have no rules for what I produce. So it doesn't matter. Like I'm writing whether or not I write one great sentence or one great paragraph or nothing. I also am allowed to go on Twitter. Like I have, I just, you know, as long as I've got my butt in the chair and I'm playing with words, usually what I'll do is I'll get to the point where I'm just bored enough to start playing with playing with language. And that's like the only goal for me. I am not hard on myself as a writer and I don't evaluate my daily production based on word count, based on was this good or bad. I just don't care really. And I really think that it's just like taking your meds every day. like. Every day I show up to the page, every day I feel like I'm consistently pretty terrible, but over time, like, you know, I clean things up and then things are, you know, they're, they're pretty doable. But so that's my, that's my sort of system is like no judgment at all. Okay. That's really helpful. And that's nice to hear from you as someone who's <laughs> a talented writer. <laughs> those, those feelings as well is reassuring. Um, so one last final question that someone had asked at the beginning, um, what publications have you found to be most receptive to chronic pain related content? Or do you have sort of suggestions for where people um, might, you know, try submitting their work? Definitely, I do. Um, so one of the links on the handout is to um, a part of my blog where I keep a list of um, books in jo different genres, creative creative writing, mostly nonfiction about um, pain and disability. So I've got first a section of memoirs, I think, and then there's a selection of journals that are focused on pain and disability. So you could submit to any of those. There's, um, there's just a really cool, a lot of the people, like a, there's some journals like, um, like Rogue Agent is, is one where I've written stuff that is sort of like weird floaty pain paragraphs that don't fit into an essay. I mean, who knew? That's a poem. Like I've had poetry published that was just sort of a weird paragraph. So you never know what these things that you write are going to turn into. Um, oh, and also, so um, I'm editing um, an upcoming issue of Brevity, and that's a, a journal of brief nonfiction. And we are running, we're doing a special issue on disability and obviously chronic pain of all types is, uh, is a disability for many. And so if you wanna submit, that's a great, uh, it's a great outlet and we'd love to, to see your work. Um, the Rumpus has been wonderful. 
Um, but yeah, check out that list because there's a lot of there's a lot of good places. Awesome. That is great to know. And it, it almost I don't know if you find this too, but it seems like there is an increasing number of outlets that are, you know, interested in covering sort of health issues and disability issues, which is really nice to see. I totally um, yeah, I find that definitely. If you're on Twitter, I'm always sharing that kind of stuff, and there's more and more calls for submissions. It's super. It's like it's an exciting time to be trying to uh, to, to experiment with this. Awesome. So on that note, um, it's two o'clock, so we're going to switch over to our updates. But before we do, I want to read one last metaphor. Okay, I'm reading all of them, and I just can't resist. Oh, good. Uh, so one is getting out of bed. The first sour note hit. Each step and stumble, a cymbal crash as the joints fail to find the spoon. Mm. Wow. That's really lovely. Um, but yeah, again, guys, just remember to send your metaphors over to either of us or to both of us if you are interested in having them shared. Um, and we can sort of suss out if people are comfortable with like first names being shared or, you know, full names or whatever might make sense, but I think these are really wonderful and would be um, awesome to put out there in the world. So, so much, thank you so much. Um, you are amazing and, um, you know, as, as therapeutic as writing about chronic pain can be personally, I mean, it's also just such a powerful way to try to raise awareness in people who don't have chronic pain. Um, mm -hmm and to try to get them to understand. So the work you're doing is very much appreciated by us. I mean, we appreciate your time um, this afternoon. And so with that, everyone, just a plug for Sonia's book. Um, yeah. Not ask us to put this up here, but we wanted to. Um, so there's information about purchasing it on her website, Sonia Huber, Huber, keep pronouncing it wrong, .com. Um, and you can purchase it on places like Amazon, Barnes and Noble, you know, all the, the usual suspects. We definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, so with that, thank you again. And we're gonna move over to our department updates, which can take like 10 minutes. So we encourage you to stick around. Um, but if not, we will hopefully see you at our next webinar in January. So thank you again to Sonia. Okay, so um, I know we have some staff members waiting in the wings um, who are ready to give us some updates about things we're working on as an organization. Uh, we do have a couple people who were not able to attend to give their department updates. So you're gonna be hearing from me, Emily, a little bit more. So the first update is from um, Lori Menarca on the ambassador program, but Lori is actually running her support group as we speak, so she wasn't able to give the update. So just some quick things. Um, the nomination period for Ambassador of the Year is coming up. Nominations will be due December 31st. Um, we will be sending out information about how to nominate folks in our next newsletter, which comes out December 2nd. Um, she also wanted to mention some ways to get involved, which of course, participating in any of our support groups, you can find information about those. They're online and over the phone. Um, you can find information at uh, www.painconnection.org. Um, also, another awesome thing you can do is distribute materials and all of our materials are free. We have a bunch of different brochures and booklets um, with a lot of great information on pain and you can distribute those anywhere, you know, your doctor's office, your local library, um, obviously <laughs> try to get permission first, but uh, you can order those for free at uspainfoundation.org backslash order hyphen materials. So then we have Shana on the phone, hopefully to give us a little update about state advocacy. Shana, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, hi Shana. Hello, okay, great. Um, so on this slide, you'll see that we have quite a few engagement opportunities for you all to consider participating in. And if this is um, your first time joining one of these pep talks and you're new to the advocacy program, uh, what we do is we create various online campaigns that lets you either submit a letter to a specific lawmaker or an entire committee, make phone calls, utilize social media, et cetera, with just a few clicks of a button. And you can access all of these opportunities by visiting the advocacy section of the U.S. Pain Foundation's website. 
Uh, so at the state level, we are actually running two campaigns right now, um, the Massachusetts Senate Bill 1262 and the New York State Mid-Year Formulary Campaign. Um, so the Massachusetts bill I'll talk about first, basically it would ensure that every patient or resident of a healthcare facility has the right to prompt assessment and treatment of his or her pain with subsequent reassessment to ensure the treatment safety and efficacy. And our engagement online will let you submit a letter to the Senate Public Health Committee asking to refer that bill favorably out of the Public Health Committee. Um, if you go to online to our campaign, we'll break down the bill um, a little bit more simplistically for you because I know I'm, I'm going a little bit fast here. Um, but everything's there on the online engagement to learn more about the bill, what it would do, why it's good for pain patients. Then in New York, that engagement lets residents send a letter to Governor Cuomo asking that he sign this legislation into law. Now, what this bill would do is it would end an unfair practice that's called non-medical switching. Again, if you go into our advocacy section, you can look up all of our key priorities and issues. Non-medical switching is there. Um, basically, this bill stops mid-year formulary changes, so insurance companies in New York can no longer reduce coverage for medications during the health plan year. Uh, moving over to the federal side, we're actually running two online campaigns that relates to the recommendations released by the Pain Management Best Practices Interagency Task Force that's overseen by the Department of Health and Human Services. For those of you who have been on our pep talks and webinars before, I'm sure you've heard Cindy talk a lot about this. So the first opportunity is a targeted campaign. We're asking that a hearing be held on this pain report. So what you'll need to do is enter your zip code Find out if you have a legislator on one of the two committees that we're targeting, either the Senate Health Committee or the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, their health subcommittee. If the online engagement tells you you're not eligible to participate, what you'll want to do is you'll want to click on the other opportunity we have, which is called Email Members of Congress, ask them to hold a hearing on the new report on pain. And that'll let anyone send a pre-written letter to their U.S. Senators and Representatives. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, so this map just indicates the states that are still in session at this time. In other words, they're still doing business. There's still bills in play. Uh, Pennsylvania has a session deadline of November 29th for any of you who um, are listening and that live there. Wisconsin's uh, they're ending on December 6th. And then um, we have a handful that are ending at the end of this year, December 31st. And that includes DC, Michigan, and Ohio. Uh, Massachusetts has its last day of session for the first annual session on December 31st. And then it's going to start up again with its second annual session on January 1st. New Jersey is scheduled to end its session on January 7th of 2020. And then you'll see there in the orange, Virginia's having a special session right now, but it's slated to end around December 18th. Now I'm showing you this map because um, I wanna remind all of you that you can utilize our bill tracking tools. That's found by visiting um, our website, uspainfoundation.org backslash advocacy. You'll find an interactive map very similar to this one. And you can either click on your state or you can use a drop down menu to look up an issue. And right now there are about 243 bills that are either still in play or that have been pre-filed for next year that US Pain Foundation is tracking. So this is a time um, where we wanna try and get bills moved out of committees so they can pass both houses and make their way to your governor's desk. And just a gentle reminder, this is also a great time for you to be scheduling meetings with state lawmakers if you have an issue you'd like to see addressed as a, um, a proposed bill for 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. Um, so next up, we have an update from Ellen Smith, who's the co-director for our medical cannabis program. Ellen, I was wondering if you are there. Um, you might need to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. Um, let's see, let's start with some, it, this is actually an incredibly exciting time right now. And I think I'd like to share something 
Um, for those of you that might be new at listening to this program, uh, at this time for the medical cannabis in this country, for this past year, just to give you an idea of what we have been dealing with, there's been over 1,500 mar marijuana-related bills that have been introduced this past year. They've ranged from adopting laws to legalizing marijuana for adults to addressing revisions in the evolving medical marijuana programs um, and even to decriminalizing. Um, in 2019, just to give you an idea, there are now 10 states, including also then the District of Columbia that have legalized it for adult use and recreational use. 29 states, including also DC, Guam, and Puerto Rico have legalized for medical use. Um, and a total of 46 states in our country now have legalized access to at least some low THC cannabis products. Um, so we, we are coming very rapidly, um, very forward, which is exciting. It's been a long process. Um, the first thing you see on the screen is about the University of Maryland. It is the first um, school that's now at offering a master's uh, degree program that will be run through the pharmaceutical part of the program of their school uh, in medicine and cannabis science, which is huge. This has never been a actual program that you can get a degree in before. Um, we have a call to action uh, for S2032. Uh, this is a very exciting bill that looks very promising. Um, there's many, it has broad support, bipartisan support, which is exciting. Um, if this bill can go through, it would increase the number of manufacturers um, producing cannabis, um, which means we would have more product um, to be able to use for researching. It would reduce the restrictions for research too. Right now, it's been a very difficult process. Um, this would actually streamline uh, the time restriction that would be expected to move forward when something has been asked of and one of these researchers or anybody involved in this program that's trying to lighten up and get things to move faster. They would stop having to jump through so many hoops for each question that they ever have as they're researching this. Um, we hope that you'll have time and consider taking part of this on online um, process. You're just going to click onto this link. You should be receiving it in your emails. Um, and when you have a choice, either contacting your legislator or uh, specifically um, asking them to be part of the committee to actually set up a presentation for committee hearing, which would be very, very um, wonderful to get going. So please, if you can help us out, this would be extremely important to get through. Um, there's also a possible vote coming soon that has presently 55 co-sponsors that would remove cannabis or marijuana as a controlled substance uh, countrywide, which again would also open up the door. But strangely, just today, as I'm getting ready to, to go on to this um, webinar, um, all of a sudden I get an email and it's so exciting. What's called the MORE Act, which we have been working on since 2002, also with America for Safe Access in partnership. The MORE Act um, was um, held today in the Judiciary Committee and it was approved. Um, so if this gets to the point of becoming signed, um, this is going to allow for huge changes in society. Take it out of schedule one. The problem with cannabis being allowed throughout the world, the country, is that it's been stuck in schedule one, sitting next to um, heroin, which is clearly not where it should be. So this would open up the doors for those states that are still hesitant. If we can get it out of that and make it more legal for everybody in this country, it would really make a big difference. Also, if it was signed, it would mean insurance companies. Um, would be able to and encouraged to help cover the costs. Right now, um, the biggest problem, they had a survey, over 500 patients reported in, the biggest problem they have is the cost of cannabis because there's no um, reimbursement. So this is huge. So let's keep our fingers uh, crossed that this continues to move forward. So I could go on and on, but it's an extremely exciting time for the cannabis program right now. And we're definitely moving forward. The goal in our country is to see that every state has equal access, equal rights, that you're not gonna be limited in one state because you don't have the correct qualifying condition. Our hope in the future is that it goes back to a doctor-patient relationship of suggesting the consideration of cannabis and not being limited because of state law. So I think that pretty much covers. 
Thank you, Ellen. We appreciate that update. We know there is a lot going on, but it's all good stuff. Um, so finally, I don't know if we have Cindy, if you're on. Um, I know Cindy was working on a few things today and said she might not be able to join us. I'll give her a second, but if not, I will. You guys are just getting to hear a lot from me today. I'm sorry about that. Um, so what Cindy wanted to wanted me to tell you guys was that the FDA had a comment period that closed this Monday and they asked the public's views on two questions about pain. Um, one was, should sponsors of new opioid medications be required to demonstrate comparative advantage relative to existing opioids? And two, what incentives would better support or encourage the development of new treatments for pain? Um, so we submitted a comment to the docket and an answer, sorry, that's my cat meowing, an answer to the first question. We said that, well, we would like to see new opioids have advantage over existing opioids, um, such as lower side effect profiles, less abuse potential, and greater efficacy. We do not believe a comparative advantage over every other opioid medication for the same indication should be a requirement. Um, and then, of course, the second question, obviously, the answer is yes, and we urgently need um, some pre-approval incentives in the pain space since little has changed in the availability of new treatment options in more than a decade, except for really the, um, the creation of CGRPs for migraine. Um, and I'm actually hearing from Cindy that she is muted, and I'm going to unmute her because she is there. Cindy, can you? Yep. Can we? Oh, there you are. Okay, we do have Cindy. I'm so sorry. Um, Cindy, so I don't know if you want to just expand on that a little more. No, I think that pretty much covers it. I mean, just um, I want to thank everybody who did have a chance to write in. There were something like 400 comments. Uh, the FDA pre-approves comments, so it'll take a while for them to pre-approve to see your comment. Uh, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to see them and you'll be able to see our comment or uh, potentially we'll make a link to it. Um, so that people can can see our comment, and we um, hope that the FDA <clears throat> takes these to heart. They actually have to issue a guidance on uh, this sort of decision on pain management um, incentives for new medications and for whether they should allow new opioids on the market um, by, I believe, this summer. So we'll have to see what they come up with. That's it. Thanks, Cindy. Um, and the other thing that we wanted to mention just quickly is that there was a meeting of the Interagency Pain Research Coordinating Committee, which is a mouthful. Um, that's a committee that Cindy used to serve on, and now um, Gwen Herman, our clinical social worker and the director of our support groups, serves on. And they had a meeting on Monday, uh, but Gwen is still traveling, so she will be reporting back to us on what happened at that meeting, and that should be in our um, upcoming newsletter on December 2nd. So if you're interested in hearing what happened at that meeting, just keep an eye out for the newsletter. And then finally, one more update, and again, Gwen, <laughs> Gwen couldn't make it, so you guys are going to hear from me. Um, but we are up to 19 in-person support groups across the country. Um, we have five monthly conference call support groups, so those are great for people who, you know, have trouble traveling um, or you know don't have one nearby yet you can just call in they're totally free um, and then you know the way that we expand our support group offerings is by training peer leaders to run support groups and they're trained by Gwen who again is a clinical social worker um, you go for the weekend um, and I forget Cindy also helps train people she's been running a support group for I think like two decades or more. Um, so the two of them are, have a lot of expertise and they basically give you all the tools you need to know for starting up a support group and having it be successful and effective for other people with pain. So with that in mind, our next training is going to be in San Diego, which I'm sure a lot of us in the Northeast um, would love to visit this winter. And that training will be February 29th through the 30th. And we will have details on how to apply in our next newsletter. Again, it's going to be a big newsletter on December 2nd. Um, and if you are signed up with us as a volunteer, we offer scholarships to attend this training. So there is um, no cost or very minimal cost to actually attend 
the trainings um, so long as you're signed up as a volunteer and we have space. So that brings us to the conclusion of our um, staff updates. I tried to keep it pretty quick. It was about 20 minutes, so thanks to those of you who stuck with us. Um, just as a reminder, you can email any of us at any time. Here are all of our email addresses. If you're not sure who to email, you can just send one to contact at uspainfoundation.org um, and we will get it to the right person. So just quickly, does anyone have any questions for any of the staff who are on right now? I'm not seeing anything so far. Um, just some folks saying thanks, and you are so welcome. We really appreciate everyone who joins us on these, these webinars. Um, if you are, haven't signed up as an advocate or an ambassador with us, um, you can do so by signing up at uspainfoundation.org backslash get hyphen involved. Um, that will get you onto our mailing list, and that's the best way to hear about all these um, different opportunities to take action um, straight to your inbox. So we highly encourage that. And we'll have our next pep talk webinar on January 21st at 1 p.m. EST. Um, we're still working out what the topic will be, but we'll try to have something awesome and interesting for you. And again, you can always look at our archive of webinars on our website, um, uspainfoundation.org backslash webinars. Um, you have to register to watch them, but those are all available for you at any time. So thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate you, and we hope to have you at our next event. Take care, guys.